afternoon. My name is Ross Portnert, and I'm a junior here at Fairleigh Dickinson University and a political science major. I want to welcome everyone to the College at Florham Library for the next series in the public mind. First, I want to thank Muriel Webb, the director of the College at Florham Library, for her support of the public mind series. I would also like to mention the College, the College at Florham's library current exhibit on contemporary Japan, which includes two books from Fairleigh Dickinson's own Peter Woolley. Other books were given as a gift from the Nippon Foundation in Japan, and everyone can find the posters on the walls of the library's lobby. For the first time all semester in the Public Mind series, there are two distinguished speakers today. They are Mr. Josh Margolin and Mr. Ted Sherman. These men are the authors of The Jersey Sting, a true story of the corrupt Poles, money laundering rabbis, black market kidneys, and the informant who brought it all down. The book is currently being sold in the back of the room, and the speakers have said they're happy to stick around after to sign any books. The book details Solomon Dweck's Ponzi scheme and how his co cooperation with the FBI led to the arrests of several politicians and others who helped him unfold his plan. Mr. Margolin and Mr. Sherman helped break the story of the 44 arrests in July 2009 that included two state assemblymen, the mayors of Hoboken, Secaucus, and Ridgefield, and five Orthodox rabbis. The book won honors from the American Society of Newspaper Editors and made the finals for a Pulitzer Prize. It was, released, it was released on March 15th and is the first book for both men who spent over seven months writing it. The book's launch party drew some well-known figures such as Governor Chris Christie, former Governor Dick Cody, and Chief Justice and former State Attorney General Stuart Rabner. Mr. Margolin received his bachelor's degree from CW Post, part of Long Island University, and spent some time at the North Jersey Herald and News before coming to the Star Ledger. Mr. Margolin now works for the New York Post. Mr. Sherman received his undergraduate degree from Hofstra University and his master's degree from Rutgers. He's the chief investigative reporter for the Star Ledger and has worked there for over 30 years. The men were also part of the team that broke the story about former Governor Jim McGreevy's resignation and won the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for breaking news reporting. Without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Mr. Josh Margolin and Mr. Ted Sherman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ross. As you heard, the, the title of our book is The Jersey Sting. Um, the, the subtitle is just a little bit longer. Um, and it looks like a lot to swallow, but today we're really going to focus on, on the first part, and, and that is a true story of corrupt pals. Um, my name is Ted Sherman. I'm a reporter at the Star-Ledger. And in, until my colleague Josh left for the greener pastures of the New York Post, we, we both worked together on a lot of stories involving corruption in New Jersey. Before I, I address that, uh, I, I'd first, the two of us actually would like to set the landscape a little bit with, with uh, a couple of paragraphs from the book, and, and Josh will start off. Politics and business come together in New Jersey like nowhere else, a universe that looks, sounds, and smells familiar, but is at the same time strange and foreign is a place where there are a few good guys, and the ones there are often learn little, earn little, if any, respect. It is a place where there are real bad guys, actual crooks, colorful villains, and even dangerous characters seduced by money and power. But they are so interesting, engaging, and quick with a tale that they are downright impossible to stay away from. There are political bosses who, when they're not ordering the assassinations of careers and reputations, are philanthropists and businessmen running schools and banks and insurance companies and law firms. There are the rabbis who lead cloistered communities and use seminaries as power bases to extract their tribute from the politicians. There are the priests who negotiate communion rights based on political stances. There are the lawyers who, as Al Pacino declares in The Devil's Advocate, have the ultimate backstage pass because the law, my boy, puts us in everything and they know everything about everyone, get paid for it to boot. There are the bagmen, the go-betweens, the intermediaries who ensure that the skids are greased, the meetings are set, and the beer is cold. Corruption seems to be in the state's DNA. Not really great for New Jersey, but in all honesty, it's been pretty good for the two of us. There's, there's, there's a lot to write about. Mayors seeking cash, state officials getting kickbacks, and councilmen willing to sell their offices for a little more than getting their driveways resurfaced. And that, that actually is a, a true story. 
A long time ago in, in Jersey City, Mayor Frank Haig set a standard for generations to come. And you can see him there on the screen. He was never paid a salary greater than $8,500 a year. Yet, curiously, when he died, he had an estate worth $10 million. In fact, voter fraud involving the counting of ballots of dead people was once so widespread in, in Jersey City that former Governor Burns still gets laughs when he tells people that after he dies, he wants to be buried in Hudson County so that he, continue, he can continue participating in the political process. But corruption has never been limited to one county. There was Patterson Mayor Marty Barnes. He went to, to jail on the strength of secret tape recordings detailing kickbacks, along with photographs of the mayor frolicking with prostitutes in Brazil. There was Mayor Sharp James of Newark. He was one of the state's most influential politicians until he was convicted of steering city land to his mistress. Crazy, right? Well, the story of the Jersey Sting was even crazier. More than 40 people were arrested on July 23rd, 2009, and they were charged with everything from money laundering, public corruption, extortion, and conspiracy. Oh yeah, and that, that guy selling black market kidneys. As the case broke, the details grew ever more juicy. There were transcripts of surveillance tapes that had religious leaders talking like they were members of the mob. There were tens of thousands of dollars exchanged in boxes of Apple Jack cereal. There was talk of, of, of knockoff designer bags. And there was an unnamed confidential informant who was unmasked in a matter of hours as a defendant in a $50 million bank fraud. And his name was Solomon Dweck, seen here. Solomon was the son of a rabbi, and he might well be one of the greatest con artists ever seen in New Jersey. And then there was this man. David Essenbach. Notice how very similar the two men look. <laughs> Yet, for some strange reason, dozens of politicians who met with him could not figure that out, even though Solomon's picture had been on the front pages of every paper in the state after he had been caught and arrested for bank fraud just a year earlier. This sting operation that we write about was an unbelievable story. It attracted international attention from New Jersey to Tel Aviv, to London. Every day it just got more and more intriguing. And we dug deeper and deeper as reporters at the Star-Ledger to find out what it was all about. During all this time, there was no thought at all to, to writing a book. We were, we were following a story. And, and, and really, it was a pretty good story. I mean, we found out long before Dweck began cooperating with the government that he had been operating a massive Ponzi scheme and ended up working for the U.S. Attorney's Office after he passed a, a bad check for $25 million at a drive-in window at a PNC bank. And for some reason, they cashed it. Sort of thing everything everybody here does every day, right? And, and if you don't have a good sense of what $25 million will buy, it's enough to buy a not-so-small corporate jet. Facing 20 years in prison, Dweck decided to cooperate with the government. But it was a hard sell to then U.S. Attorney Chris Christie. Chris Christie did not trust Dweck. He felt the bank fraud case was enough for them to all declare victory and go home. But others in his office, including, including uh, Christie's first assistant, Ralph Mara, who would later become the, the acting U.S. Attorney after Christie left to run for governor, urged that they green light the deal, and Christie ultimately did. Dweck, using his real name, quickly got into action, and the FBI began setting up targets left and right. And they, they, did, it, they did it with a hidden surveillance camera that Solomon wore someplace on his shirt. Um, and one after another, he, he started meeting with, with people. As, as we noted uh, in the book, and also even, even at the Star-Ledger, he ate with them at crowded diners, at busy pancake houses, fancy restaurants and hotels. He covered hundreds of miles shuttling from one secret meeting to another. And the FBI taped every word. It was Hoboken for breakfast. It was Brooklyn for lunch. It was plates of pasta at Casa Dante in Jersey City in the afternoon. 
and dinner on the waterfront at expensive restaurants in Weehawken. Dweck, we found, had operated at a maddening pace. He moved through a web of false identities and fake stories with meetings set up like a string of beads, sometimes three, four, five times a day. And, and I mean, it was amazing to me because the way we found this out was we took all the criminal complaints, put it into a timeline, and, and, and looked at it in chronological order. And we, we saw that he was, he was in Lakewood at one hour, he'd go to Brooklyn another hour, he'd go to Bayonne. We didn't know how he had time to eat. And meeting with targets who for some reason never suspected or second-guessed Dweck or the easy money. It was at that point that we both started thinking about a buck. The sting operation, as, as we detail in the Jersey Sting, we actually began as a money laundering case. Dweck, before he'd been arrested for the bank fraud, had been engaged in a secretive but, but apparently widespread charity scam. He was the head of, of a religious school known as the Deal Yeshiva. And what he would do was solicit donations from wealthy members of the community. And what it actually was was, was essentially a simple tax fraud. They would give the school large sums of money he would kick back all but 15% of it. They would, would uh, get that money through, through checks, through transfers from banks in Israel, or, or to uh, payments to money to companies that were associated with them. The donor would get the full benefit of the write-off, the yeshiva would get the 15%, and Dweck, out of that 15%, would take his own cut. And for him, that was no small ch pocket change, because after he was caught, it turned out that he had a plastic garbage bag stashed with a friend of his that had $1 million in cash in it. Using, using government money, Dweck, now as an informant, went to the same people in his, his very insular orthodox community and then started connecting with others that he didn't know and began laundering checks. Among them included Rabbi Eliyahu ben Hayim, who um, was his brother's father-in-law. There was Shimon Haber, who had done development deals with, with, with Dweck in the past and was willing to introduce him to others in the Hasidic community, um, uh, uh, including a number of other rabbis and this man, Levi Deutsch. But one of the questions we had from the start was, how did a nice Jewish boy from Deal get to be the poster boy for political corruption in, 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 in uh, Hudson County. And it took a while for us to figure that out, but actually it was very, very simple. Solomon Dweck became David Essenbach. And he did what so many developers, builders, and engineering firms do in New Jersey when they want government contracts or government approvals of various projects. He began buying guys who knew the, the landscape. The government had set off looking for corrupt politicians. And they began first by trying to set those up in the money laundering side of the case, set them up with people they knew. And, and the first guy they reached was this guy, John Guarini. John Guarini was a building inspector in Jersey City who didn't know about much about inspecting buildings. He actually had failed his state certification to, to inspect plumbing. So instead of firing him, they made him a taxi inspector. John then brought him to this man, Mayor Khalil, who, who um, I don't know what he did for a living. He worked for the city, but he was never at his job. Um, th there was another guy who had the unfortunate name of Ed Sheetham. And, and the defense attorneys have had a field day with him. And that brought them to the real guys who drove, drove the political side of the investigation. They started linking them up to several well-known political operatives, or as we describe them in the book, as fixers. And they included Joe Cardwell, seen here, and Jack Shaw. And this is what we said about, about fixers in the book. In Hudson County, fixers are the key to getting almost anything done. Reliable middlemen as Ralph Mara, Christie's top lieutenant and eventual successor as federal prosecutor would later describe them on live television. Want a meeting with the mayor? Need to sit down with a congressman or the candidate or the city or the council president? You need a guy with the right rep and the right set of phone numbers. 
someone who can open doors and decode the political landscape. A fixer was somebody who could tell a developer that money in politics does not signal philosophy, but is a nece necessary business tool. And it's nonpartisan. As one insider explained to Dweck, as Essenbach, on an FBI wiretap, he needed to, quote, take care of both guys, spreading his money between competing political candidates to hedge his bets as he navigated a city government as foreign to him as a third world dictatorship, a stranger in a strange land. There's no real job description for a fixer, and they don't actually usually call themselves that. They are consultants or political strategists. They are loyal to nobody, but their best client of the moment. In other words, their only loyalty is to themselves. They're people who know the details and plot the strategy, but are liable to turn on their clients for nothing more than the right price. We found, as we worked through, through, through our reporting, we found that they worked by commission. The more people they developed, delivered to Dweck, the more money they made. And it was an incentive system that swept up dozens as the spring election season in, in Hudson County began in earnest. And cash-starved candidates, like Guy Catrillo, Peter Camerino, who was the mayor of Hoboken for all of third, 23 days before he was arrested, Mariano Vega, and Leona Baldini were looking for money from a fast-talking developer who was all too willing to give them what they wanted. There were others that were also targeted but never arrested. They included Jersey City Mayor Jeremiah Healy, and Community Affairs Commissioner Joe Doria. So finally, a brief update. Since July 23, 2009, 26 people have, been, have pleaded guilty in this case. Three have been convicted, two have been acquitted, 13 are still awaiting trial. And last night, a Hoboken councilman never charged in this thing, who we discovered had secretly met with Dweck and, and, and uh, uh, agreed to take money from him until he decided maybe he wouldn't show up for the second meeting. Last night he was forced to step down from his position as, as city council uh, vice president in what would turn out to be a very contentious city council meeting. People started reading the book and, and he faces a very tough re-election battle since, since the revelations in the book came out. So, so let me just close now with a snippet from a, a recent review that, that kind of well, we, we kind of like this review. It, it, Why, we wouldn't tell you the ones we don't like. It, well, yeah, exactly. At first, it seems like the Jersey Sting has the makings of the next Goodfellas. But then you realize that no three-hour film could do justice to the richness of the story of corruption and double crosses. And with that, I hand it over to my colleague, Josh Morville. The story of the Jersey Sting is, in some ways, very well known or at least it feels like it's well known. The framework feels well known. This is obviously an audience that follows the news, so if, if you follow whatever your local paper is anywhere in New Jersey, you, you saw what happened on July 23rd, 2009. You saw the aftermath. We, we, there, there were news reports. It seemed like the, the national press had not only descended on New Jersey, but that they had all bought homes in Hudson County and they weren't moving out. But as we started developing the story more and, and peeling back the layers, we came to understand far more than we ever could have imagined. And one of the critical things that becomes clear through the book and obviously through our research, the Jersey Sting in large part occurred as a result of failed political reforms. It's amazing to think about it, but over the course of time, and there are a lot of politics and journalism students in the room. But over the course of time, we have watched as there have been the measures and the countermeasures, the failings of the political leadership, and then the efforts to reform the political culture. And that's not a, a, a story that's unique to New Jersey. In fact, it's not unique to the United States. It's, we're watching political reforms occur in the Arab world right now as we speak. One of the things that one of the great or believed to be a great reformist idea from the last century was nonpartisan elections. And the idea being that you take a community like Newark or Jersey City or even New York City, although New York City never actually 
went through this particular reform, it was never voted in. But you take a community like that, and you think back to, the, to, to know that a place like that will be, be because of the population demographics, it will be basically a democratic majority almost indefinitely, permanently, it feels like. And in fact, when I grew up in New York City uh, in Queens, my father would always say that you have to vote in the primary because he's a Democrat, because otherwise you don't get to vote in New York City because the general election until Rudy Giuliani was roughly meaningless. So in Jersey City and Newark and, and towns like that, they put in place nonpartisan elections. The idea being that the parties should not control local government because that's, that, that's a recipe for one party rule. So everybody can run in a sort of free-for-all. And free-for-all is the right term. It's the term we use in the Jersey State. What has happened, though, is the reform has failed, largely. I'm not saying everywhere, but the reform has failed. The, without the structure of party mechanisms to support campaigns and candidates, you now have candidates all racing around, scrounging around for money. They need money. And when you get closer to New York City, like Hoboken and Jersey City, you have a, another competing political reality of how expensive it is to actually run a campaign. In order for people in Hoboken and Jersey City to know your name, for instance, I'm running for mayor of Hoboken, I will need to spend the highest amount in American politics on campaign advertising in New York City where I will be advertising my name to the people in Hoboken while also spending the same money to advertise it to people in Queens and Long Island and Westchester because that's the nature of the New York City media market. So you have this free-for-all without party structure put in place in the most expensive place in the world to run a campaign. That's a recipe for people who do not have the means of John Corzine to do whatever they have to do to get money. And that really answered the question that we, we all had, reading the stories, writing the stories, we, we wanted to know why were these people who didn't seem to, to live incredible lives with lifestyles of traveling to the Bahamas and going all over, why would these people want, want all this money? And the answer was it, was, it was really to fund their campaigns. They were out of cash. And, and the theme throughout the Jersey Sting is that the people caught on the political side of the case, the worst of them, not only took this money when offered, they went back for more and more aggressively. Solomon Dweck was not just an informant who, as some have suggested, was entrapping them. In a lot of these cases, Solomon Dweck was viewed by these candidates to be their permanent sugar daddy. And he will always be there with envelopes of five and $10,000 in cash to fund their political future. And it was, it was remarkable to see the, the, the failed reform at work because having covered politics for so long in New Jersey, I've actually lived through a couple of reform efforts and, and lived long enough and, and followed it long enough to see failures, but nothing on this scale. What we also needed to do when we embarked on this process was get to the bottom of the cases surrounding Jerry Healy, and Joe Doria. We had no idea where the Jersey Sting research was going to take us. And frankly, uh, most investigative reporting projects don't have a map. And you can't know what the finish line looks like. We had the framework of arrests on July 23rd, 09. And, on, and the bookend to that was the outcome of the, of the, the trials. All of that in between, we had no idea what it was going to look like. So we needed to set up the questions, and the questions about Healy and Doria were critical. Because, for those of you who follow politics, you know that that's been among the most, contra the most controversial topics relating to this investigation. So one by one, we ended up peeling it back. Now, neither Doria nor Healy was ever charged, and we, can, we need to say that at the outset. Both Doria and Healy seemed to know that they were in the crosshairs after the morning of July 23rd, but they didn't understand why. So we were able to tell them and the rest of the world about it. And the truth is they are both still 
under federal investigation. And that's a term that gets thrown around, especially in newsrooms and in political campaigns. But it's true. It's real. There are open files. Jerry Healy and Joe Doria, if they were sitting here or standing here right now, would, would thump on the podium and say it's unfair. But they are under investigation. The feds believe, based on their sources, based on, on evidence that they have obtained through informants, through surveillance recordings, they believe that there's at least a fighting chance, a reasonable suspicion, or probable cause that Jerry Healy and Joe Doria are on the tape. And Joe, Jerry Healy and Joe Doria disagree, obviously, and their, their, their allies and aides have, have been insistent with us that this is just, there are a series of coincidences at work here, there's misunderstandings, there's confusion, but that's what the feds believe. Uh, in Jerry Healy's case, the feds went about surrounding him. They sent Dweck in as an informant to a number of people in his inner circle. Deputy Mayor Baldini, who has actually, she was the first who was convicted in this case. And his campaign manager, Harold Bud Demolier, who doubles as the uh, director of roads and public property in Hudson County government as a senior member of the staff of the Hudson County executive. And Dweck, through the fixers, got in with these two people. And in the case, uh, and, and in Baldini's case, campaign contributions were, were delivered to the Healy reelection campaign. In Demolier's case, uh, actual cash was delivered. And Demolier, interestingly, while Baldini has been convicted, Demolier was never arrested, Demolier was never charged. Demolier is sitting there working in Hudson County right now, and had it not been for the research that we did to produce the Jersey Sting, nobody would know that, but Demolier took $20,000 in cash from the federal government as part of this investigation. He explains that he was simply taking it as a private consultant to Solomon Dweck, the federal informant. There's no reason, there's no way to dispute that. That's his, as we call it in politics, that's his spin. And that's fine, but he's never been arrested and he's never been charged. The other thing here, and this is, this is also important to, to when you think about the accusations that have been leveled against Chris Christie. People in politics, especially in democratic politics, believe that Chris Christie was on a jihad to destroy the Democratic Party in he did destroy the Democratic Party in New Jersey, but the question is, was that legitimate politics, or was that a function of him misusing his power as the United States Attorney and as the, federal, this, the, the chief federal prosecutor in the state? And we did try to answer that question. The reality is, it's almost impossible to know, or impossible to know what's going on in somebody's heart and in somebody's mind. Dweck went into Hudson County, and the feds established probable cause for wanting to arrest a number of politicians, they, or for wanting to, to sting a number of politicians they believed were on the take, and most of them were on the take. And a, a huge number of them have already pleaded guilty. So is Chris Christie at fault for setting up bad guys? It's, it's, hard, it's hard to make that judgment. The, 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 ar the argument the other way, to be fair, is there are plenty of bad guys in New Jersey politics. Why choose these bad guys? Well, OK, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. Uh, but the Hudson County political season, as we discussed, is really the landscape that Dweck operated on. There are plenty of Republicans involved in this story, by the way. There, one assemblyman, Dan Van Pelt, has already been convicted. He was the second to be convicted. He's a Republican. And as we were able to uncover in our research, Chris Christie authorized the targeting of a gentleman named George Gilmore, who is the Ocean County Republican chairman. And in the end, Gilmore did meet with the informant. He never took money. For whatever reason, he would never meet with the informant again. And so George Gilmore went on to help Chris Christie win the governor's race. Um, the governor's race is important also, and I'll close with this. It can't be left out. It can't be glossed over. The arrests and massive perp walks of July 23, 2009 occurred at the height of an overheated political season. Let's take you back. 
Chris Christie, a Republican dependent on campaign contributions and public financing, is the new Republican nominee versus John Corzine, one of the wealthiest men in New Jersey, who has somewhere between two and three hundred two and three hundred million dollars in the bank. And Corzine is a Democrat, a liberal, a friend of the president, and he is running for reelection amid the economic collapse, the Great Recession that we're living through. Corzine's poll numbers are terrible. His level of support among party leaders is terrible. And Chris Christie was perceived to be the only Republican with even a fighting chance to win the governor's election in New Jersey. And in the end, Chris Christie wins, but he does not believe that he really would be able to win because, I mean, I don't know if there are any other reporters in the room, but reporters believe that a guy with $300 million in a state like New Jersey where there's a Democratic registration advantage, we believe that the calculations are, no matter what happens, the Democrat will pull it out in that, in that equation. But Chris Christie comes with things working in his favor. He has a reputation in 2009 of having been a corruption-busting federal prosecutor. Now, the election is not typically won on corruption, and no one really believed that John Corzine was corrupt in the sense of taking graft. There are people who believe that John Corzine was corrupt in it, it having to do with his relationship with Carla Katz, the union leader, having to do with his relationship with other corrupt leaders of the party, like Marty Barnes, not Marty Barnes, but like Sharp James and other people that have gone to jail. But the Corzine himself was never viewed to be on the take. And I guess when you're worth $300 million, there's not a lot of incentive to taking $5,000 in an envelope. Um, although stranger things really have happened in New Jersey. But the Corzine, Corzine's problem with corruption, and this is really what it came down to on July 23rd, Corzine had a problem because the economy was bad. He had a problem because unemployment was high. He had a problem because his party leaders were angry with him, and he was not really a good politician, despite being a great businessman. Now, you couple that with Corzine having to face a corruption buster, and now all of a sudden corruption is exploding on the front pages of papers around the state and across the country. That was bad news for him. As we were able to learn in the Jersey Sting in our research, it was far worse news for him than anybody could ever have imagined. As political reporters, we're trained to believe that there's the truth of covering a campaign is that the two people who are running have complete belief in themselves. This guy says he's going to win, that guy says he's going to win, and they're going to fight to the death. And New Jersey really is usually to the death. And they believe in their cause. How else can you get up in the morning and get in the car and drive the turnpike and push the buttons and shake all the hands and live through having to be questioned by guys who are, are as obnoxious as me and in some cases more obnoxious than me if you don't really feel like you can win? But as we learned, John Corzine was literally living through the, the summer of his discontent. He didn't believe he could win the worst thing that could happen to a candidate in a race like that. He didn't believe he could win. The people around him didn't believe he could win. He thought the, 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 the cause was already lost. And then he just ever so briefly gets a moment where he's feeling good about it. And he's feeling terrible, but he's feeling OK. Remember the picture, John Corzine, Barack Obama, sweating in shirt sleeves, sweat dripping through their shirts, at the Arts Center, seven days before July 23rd, 2009. And they love each other, and they arm in arm, and there are signs that say Obama Corzine, as though Corzine had become the vice presidential nominee. And the place is packed, and college students from all over are going down there. And so they're looking to go see the president, who is a rock star. But fine, they were there for a Corzine event, and Corzine was loving it. And he comes back, and finally, he feels a little bit of momentum. Maybe we'll pull this out after all. Maybe the president will take us over the finish line, drag us over the finish line. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And then, as we lay out in great detail, his, his phone rings next to his bed one morning in Hoboken, seven days later. It's before 7 o'clock in the morning, and it turns out the feds are not only arresting people in his party, in his city, 
They are arresting people in his building. Two floors below the gubernatorial penthouse, one of the bag men who has since pleaded guilty was being hauled out in cuffs for his walk of shame, as they call it, in front of our friends in the photo pool. And John Corzine is told by his senior aide, who gets him on the phone, turn on the TV and don't answer the telephone. And as we lay out, a wake of sorts then is begun at Corzine's home in Hoboken. He then realizes the campaign is over. There would be a lot of twists and turns, and we're glad to talk about that. There was an issue about whether Chris Christie was fat and whether he was too fat to be governor. There was an issue about whether or not there was an issue about whether or not the economy was bad or should, or could be worse. Chris Christie had a terrible first debate, and there was a third-party candidate who put together a tax package that everyone thought was going to sink Chris Christie. And there would be a lot of fun politics and dirty politics. But the truth is, John Corzine, as we are, were able to learn and are able to tell for the first time, knew at 7 o'clock on July 23, 2009, his governorship had ended. With that, we are so glad to be here. Peter, I want to remark on how you are the featured exhibit next door, which, I mean, I, that's a little bit odd, but OK. It's New Jersey, so thank you very much. And please, we'd love to talk to you and answer your questions. My name is Russell Nielsen, and I'll be the question facilitator for, this, uh, for these questions. And um, I will start with the opening question, and then afterwards, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand, and I'll uh, try to get around the room and make sure everybody's questions are answered. Uh, my first question is, you both are journalists by profession, and I wanted to know what led to, from just covering the story and writing about it, to deciding to make it into a full uh, book, to disclose uh, the information into a book. What led to that? To, uh... We had no thought about writing a book. We were both in the newsroom. When, when this thing came down, we, we thought it was fascinating. We kept following it as reporters for the ledger for, for weeks upon weeks. And, and we didn't really start thinking about it until uh, we, we started getting a thread of the narrative of what Dweck was doing on a day-by-day -day basis. I mentioned earlier about how we had gone through all the criminal complaints. We put that into a timeline. And it, it was just fascinating to see what he was doing on a day-by-day -day basis. About the same time, we got a call from, uh, from uh, an agent out in, in California who had seen the, the uh, pictures of, of the rabbis being brought into custody. In and, the New York Times. In the New York Times, but he's in California. What can do? <laughs> and, and the rest was good luck. We, he, he put in a proposal. St. Martin's Press liked it, and, and here we are. My question is also related to your profession. Did you ever, well, two questions, actually. Did you ever feel threatened personally in reporting this book, or doing your reporting for the Star-Ledger? And the other one is, uh, James O'Keefe has uh, said in interviews that he believes he's using the techniques of in investigative journalism in his, <laughs> in his pranks. But I heard you say earlier that when you started this work, you didn't know what the outcome was. It seems to me that's a basic difference. Well, th there's, there's two very, there's two, qu two questions there. So the, the, the issue about feeling any personal uh, fear of, of physical harm. We have had that experience, but not in this, not in this story. Um, and for the most part, I've done this now 20 years. Ted's done it for more than 30. And most times that you're worried about physical harm as a reporter, it's usually just a little too much TV getting in your head. Or your editor. Or your editor or something. I mean, I, I don't really want to go into it now because we're, we're being videoed, but you know, there's a specific instance that I'm thinking about where uh, my concern of, of physical safety was more serious to me given the fact that I have children. Um, I had been, there had been moments in my career before I was a father where the answer pretty much is, uh, who cares, no one's going to get me, and if they are, you know, whatever, it's that kind of thing. As for James O'Keefe, I, I don't know, I have to tell you, between the book, and the fact that we're both full-time reporters, I can 
safely say neither one of us has spent a, a lot of time studying all of his various interviews and all of his various techniques. Let me say this. I have no problem with secret camera reporting. I have a problem with editing secret camera footage that shows a particular bet. So this week, we were questioned. Oh, no, let me take you back. Ted pointed out that Councilman Michael Russo in Hoboken resigned his council vice presidency and the chairmanship of the finance committee last night as a result of a revelation in the Jersey Sting. The revelation in the Jersey Sting about him, which I'm not going to detail so you can all go buy the book, um, the, revelation, the revelation was based on a secret surveillance recording that we obtained. And I listened to it and watched it, and I briefed Ted on it because that was the way part of our process was we couldn't both do everything, so some of the things he did, some of the things I did, I did this. And I watched it in full. And I briefed it to him, and then we synopsized it in the book. That is roughly the journalistic technique. You depend on me to give you a good summary with all sides of an issue, of a story. So in Hoboken, Councilman Russo put out a statement without ever responding to any of our inquiries to him, without responding to anyone else's inquiries to him afterwards, puts out a statement roughly calling us liars, not in a nasty way. I'm not taking it personally. I've been called far worse. My father in laws in the room. He calls me far worse. But we were called, we were called liars. We were basically that we either had edited it to show a certain thing or it didn't really show that or we omitted what he really said that was exculpatory for use of a, a lawyerly term. Well, in our business, Facts are facts. They will show you what they show you. So we did a little bit of considering it. We have issues to deal with, and I'm also not going to lay all of those out. But we ended up on Monday releasing the full video. We had no fear that we were somehow selectively editing out his exculpatory information. We put out the video. Two days later, he resigned from his council position. I mean, it says what it says. So going back to James O'Keefe, you, you, a lot of times, you might know what your story is going to say in an investigative thing. I mean, the standard, the standard story process is, or a standard story process is, psst, Josh, the mayor's on the take. OK, Mr. Tipster, how do I prove it? You prove it this way. OK, and then you go do it. You know what the story is going to say, but you have to prove it. So if James O'Keefe, to use his most recent flare up, uh, you know, catching the Planned Parenthood people in talking about how they recommend lying to the underage girls who get pregnant. If that's a valid news story for whatever organization wants to run it, or for his website or something, that's his decision, that's his news judgment. In our view, that would require, though, that he give a full airing of what it is. So if there is anything exculpatory there, then you, you need to, to show it. And I don't know how he edited it. The other thing that, I, that was a little bit disturbing about James O'Keefe, and I probably shouldn't say this, because then he'll come trying to secret, secretly record me. But um, he, went, he went down to, uh, to an event in Monmouth County with the Tea Party. And he would not allow his presentation to be recorded. That struck me as a little bit hypocritical. I. Um, when I speak to college classes, I've had this occur a couple of times, college professors are, are very gracious in saying, Josh, you can tell us your true feelings or your true opinions about something. We're off the record here. And my standard response always is, I appreciate it, but I don't go off the record. I insist that Chris Christie standing in front of me talks to me on the record. So how would I be able to do my business and, and be able to get into a fight with Big Chris if I'm going to FDU or to Rutgers and having an off-the-record conversation because I want to give my opinion. It's just not cool. You know? If you're James O'Keefe and you want to live by the camera, you got to die by the camera. Uh, this question is actually for uh, both of you. Um, what was the most uh, surprising discovery you made throughout your research, either when the, first, the story first broke or throughout the research of your book? I guess the most surprising thing to us, to me, was, was the fact that there were individuals given money who, who were never charged in the case. Um, and, and they were, very, Bud Demolier was one of them. He was, he was very, very high up in the Healy administration. And it, 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 when, when we came across 
the, the evidence that, that had happened, it, 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 was, uh, it was really an eye-opener. And with Bud Demolier, it was especially interesting because Ted and I, some of these interviews Ted and I did conduct together. And there's one interview in particular and follow-ups that I'm thinking about where somebody very, very close to Healy insisted that Leona Baldini was not representative of the Healy campaign. The Healy campaign was legitimate. Nobody was dirty. They weren't taking dirty money. And the key piece of evidence for this spin of their legitimacy was Leona's not in charge of the money. Bud Demolier's in charge of the money. So lo and behold, two weeks later, I get video records of Bud Demolier taking care. So that was pretty remarkable. For me, it was um, when I learned that John Corzine had personally given up the faith that he could win the re-election. I'm telling you, that was, you can't, until you're a political reporter, you can't appreciate how remarkable it is to learn that the candidate himself does not believe he can win an election. It's, it's just, it's unprecedented. I'm actually uh, from one of the towns where the mayor was uh, caught in the uh, sting from Richfield, where the uh, mayor survived the uh, recall election, mm -hmm. pleaded not guilty, and then actually was found not guilty. I yeah. wonder if you could uh, comment on why he was found not guilty or what happened with that one that was different from the other cases. What you will find if you read the book is that... And only if you read the book. <laughs> and now we don't have to answer the question. There, there was a lot of controversy within the office over, over some of the, the cases that were brought. There was a lot of turmoil in the last few weeks before the, the case was concluded, and, and mistakes were made. And, and um, by the time the cases actually were brought down, they, they, they couldn't go back on it. They, they had made the mistakes. They had to go forward. It was a weak case. My question is in regards to basically, given that we see this problem now with campaign financing and how the elections are set up, how do you think campaign financing strategy is going to change? Are we going to see more of a move towards cheaper alternatives like quote unquote grassroots movements or astroturfing, whatever you want to call them? Or is it just going to be business as usual and people are going to continue taking money? Well, this is, this is the great political reporter's debate. I, in my career, I have staked out a public position only once. I believe that it's important for me to have no opinion whatsoever. And the only thing I believe, and I'm willing to say publicly about what I do, what I cover, is that I believe there needs to be a way to take all of money out of politics. Because that's the problem. We are living through the era of pay-to-play reform. And I have covered campaigns before pay-to-play reform and after pay-to-play reform. And I find it less transparent now. We have had the explosion of the internet. We can do 24-hour reporting of everything. And meantime, it is harder today for me, and I'm good at this, to track campaign money than it was to track it a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. So that's, that's one piece of this. The other thing is, let's remember, it's been illegal to take bribes in this country since the founding of the country, essentially, Peter, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean you don't have to be a political scientist to know that to know that if somebody wants something because you're mayor and gives you five grand because of it, you're doing something wrong. So I don't know that there's, what reform, I'm not saying this facetiously or to be glib about it, but what reform can be put in place to get people to stop taking bribes, other than to stop letting them take bribes and putting them in jail? The laws have been changed. The sentencing guidelines have been changed. I'll tell you, there's one thing that people should know that because in, in response to a lot of this kind of thing, the sentences for taking bribes in the federal system now are off the charts. I mean, seriously, you ought to go do some insider trading if you really care about money that badly because you'd serve less time. It's terrible. So these people, this guy that was sentenced this week, well, actually, he's not a good case because he's the money launderer. But there was some, I mean, um, which case was it that the judge made his comment recently? The judge, oh, Dweck. Was it Dweck's case? The judge overseeing all of these prosecutions is a really, really well-regarded federal judge in Newark named Jose Linares. Really spectacular guy. He's tough talking. He's big. He's tall. The lawyers love him. The defense lawyers love him. And he basically laid down the gauntlet that this are, these are bad cases. And these people that get convicted, they are going to be looking at striped sunlight for a long time. It's just a bad idea. And it's bad in New Jersey, seriously. I don't know if there's any elected officials in New Jersey, but my god. 
We have lived now through 100 years of the US Attorney's Office in New Jersey arresting politicians on the take. What more than the picture that Ted has been showing of, of the guys with the, with the, with the stripe, the, the yellow stripe in front, perp walking rabbis? What, what do you need? What do you need to stop taking money in New Jersey? I don't know the answer. I honestly, I wish I knew the answer for what it would take to get Pauls to stop taking bribes. But it actually seems like it's all over. I'm, I'm working at the New York Post now. A very, very prominent state senator in Brooklyn just got nailed on a corruption case. Philadelphia, the last mayor, was run out of town on a rail because of it. A whole bunch of his, of his top cronies went to, went to jail. The, tre the city treasurer, I don't know. Next question. Just uh, two questions. Uh, the first one, did the FBI target these people specifically and use DWEC because they knew that they had taken bribes in the past, some of them, some of them not, and thought that some of them would take bribes, even though they never did before. I, you know, when I read this, I'm like, I, I'm never sure who, you know, how that works. And the other question, I keep waiting to hear what kind of sentence will Dweck get for what he did before he became the FBI informant, because, I mean, that was, well, we'll answer them in reverse, in reverse order. Okay. Uh, Dweck pled guilty. He, he faces, faces uh, 9 to 11 years under the sentencing guidelines. He will not be sentenced until everybody in this case is adjudicated and, and, and sentenced. So, so we don't know what he's going to get. Um, the, the, the tough words from the judge last week suggest he, he might not be getting a get-out-of-jail-free card, but... Nobody knows right now. The, the smart money is on two to three years instead of 30. He was facing 30 on the bank fraud charges originally. So they allowed him, you know, it was a classic plea bargain where they allowed him to plead to certain charges. That brings the sentencing range far lower. As far as the second question is, is concerned, they can't just go out and say, I think Josh is dirty. I'm going to go after Josh. They have to. They have to have a reason to go after somebody. They have to have some evidence, what they call, call a predicate act. They, they need to know that, that somebody is willing to take a bribe from somebody else. That's one of the reasons why the fixers were so helpful to them, because when they went to these political operatives and said, I'm looking, Dweck, as Essenbach said, I'm looking for guys who, who know how I operate, who, who will play ball, and, and these operatives would say, well, Go to this guy. He, he'll take the money. So we actually have stories of people in the Jersey Sting who some of the fixers wanted to set Dweck up with. The feds would not allow those meetings to occur. You're getting to the heart of the legal issue of entrapment. And entrapment, the, the, the easiest, simplest way for us to explain it, and clearly we're not lawyers, is it's not entrapment if you're already if you already have a predilection to do the crime. If, you're already, if you, ma'am, are on the take, then it's not illegal for the feds to send me in to bribe you. But if we have no reason to believe that you're on the take and you're just a legitimate politician, we can't send somebody in. After investigating the subject, what did you find was the, mo like the biggest instance of corruption or criminal activity? I mean, black market kidneys sounds pretty bad. Black market kidneys sounded very bad to us as well, and the interesting thing about that is, is uh, of all the cases brought in this investigation, um, the, the guy, who, if, if he's ever convicted on this case, probably faces the least amount of jail time. Um, it's actually the first time the, the government has prosecuted somebody for, for human organ trafficking. It's a, it's a law that's been on the books so long that it was actually drafted by a young congressman from Tennessee by the name of Al Gore before he invented the internet. And, and nobody, nobody has been prosecuted since then. Uh, thank you. I'm a firm believer that investigative and political reporting is a critical part of our, you know, crime prevention, particularly in government. You're the one. I believe that. <laughs> I believe that. True, but as an, an, an elected official myself. Where, where do you serve, sir? Madison, former and mayor. Former mayor? Former mayor. Do you want to admit to any graft at this point? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have my own policeman here somewhere <laughs> uh, in, in the audience. 
Uh, it's just between us and the video camera. Don't worry about it. <laughs> My question is, uh, do you feel like an endangered species with the, the, the financial problems that newspapers are having and the other printed material? Or is there something that is coming along that's going to back up the reduction in reporters? It's hard, it's hard to, to know how to feel. The truth is that the business model that has underpinned news organizations since the founding of the republic, since Zenger and the printing press and, and, you know, and all the work that he did and going to jail in, in lower Manhattan, it's, it's hard to know where things will shake out. That's, that's the honest thing. But on the flip side, Mike Bloomberg runs the largest news organization in the world right now, and he's making money hand over fist. And I work for Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, and they seem to, seem to be making money. And the, the best answer is what the economists say. We're living through a period of creative destruction. That means that there's some creative going on, and there's a lot of destruction going on, and some of us are getting hurt by it, and there's a lot of layoffs. But there are people are finding new vehicles. The internet has been a tremendous source of information and a tremendous resource for investigative journalism because now everybody can go out and publish when 20 years ago you needed to have some way to publish. So I don't really know the answer. It does feel, it's difficult sometimes and we see a lot of good investigative reporters who are leaving the business. The, the, the problem that has been caused by the collapse of the business model and, and advertising revenue has led to very, very senior smart and experienced people leaving because, like us, people need to be able to earn a wage that allows you to own a house in New Jersey and support three children in New Jersey. And, you know, you can't afford to live on 25 grand the way you can when you're 26 years old. Hi, thank you. Is there a common position that these men are running for? Uh, some of them are running for mayor. Some of them are running for, for council. You know, they're, they're nothing more common than that. I mean, those are the elections in, in the spring are typically the local elections, count, mayor and council. You don't have, in New Jersey, we don't have nonpartisan elections for, for other positions, just the local the only, th the only thing common was they were all seeking to raise money. Yeah. Right. And in fact, this guy Russo, who we, uh, who we wrote about, he wasn't even running for anything. He was supporting a council slate and a mayoral candidate, but he wasn't even on the ballot. In the beginning of your presentation, you spoke about Frank Haig and um, Obviously, there's a lot that assumes that he was caught up in a lot of corruption for his final estate being worth so much money. But in your opinion, uh, Frank Haig is argued as being one of probably the best mayors to ever come out of Jersey City for what he kicked back for the city and the uh, hospitals and all the infrastructure he put in and his interest within the city. Despite the um, heads such as Solomon Dweck and these fixers who were out for their best interest and for their wallets as much as garbage bags full of money, is corruption all that bad for city officials who maybe we're looking at this corruption as just an, a way to get into office or get themselves into a position to maybe kick back for cities? So what you're saying is, is, is um, it's okay as, as, as long as the city is going, going well, fine? Well, not as much okay, but like as you guys had said with the synopsis and how you look at both sides of the stories since that is your profession, in your opinion, is corruption for city officials who maybe aren't looking out for the best interests of their own pockets as much as for these cities who do have so much problems, is, is corruption all that bad and something that we should focus so much on? It's a, it's a great question. It, 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 on some level, it's almost unanswerable because it, it, it gets to your own personal view of, of morality and ethics. I mean, let's, let's look at the city of New Brunswick. There are people in this room who remember when the city of New Brunswick, when you would not want to have your car stuck in New Brunswick at all, even in daylight. There are people that went to Rutgers, like my wife, who you know, knew the fastest way out of town and used it to get in and out of New Brunswick all the time. Now we live in an era where New Brunswick is a destination. They have a second luxury hotel that's just been built. In fact, our launch party was there. And um, great restaurants. There's three thriving theater venues. Now New Brunswick was put on the path to its renaissance by a man who just got out of prison, Senator John Lynch. I mean, John Lynch was a great mayor to the extent that New, that New Brunswick's renaissance was his doing. John Lynch is also an ex-con because of corruption. So I don't, I, I don't really know the answer. I, don't, I mean, I think it's everybody's own view. We can say that certain corrupt mayors are bad. Sharp James was a bad mayor, and he was corrupt. 
Now, there are those who believe that he was corrupt, he was bad because he was corrupt. Fine. But if you go to the city of Newark, you will see his entire, his legacy of rebuilding Newark was really nothing until Jim McGreevy gave him the arena. And that was really a state, a state thing anyway. But Newark is not better off because of a corrupt mayor. I don't really know. I mean, look, there are people who have accused Rudy Giuliani of running the city badly and, and, and cronyism. And look at Bernie Carrick, who is former, his former police commissioner, who's now serving, I think, four and a half years in federal prison. Giuliani is also considered to be the man that turned New York City around, that cleaned up Times Square. You can walk from Times Square to Penn Station now without having to hold on to your wallet or pray for your life. I don't really know the answer. Hello, I have a comment and a question. Uh, first, the New Jersey uh, Depart Division, Department of Community Affairs has issued a, a regulation saying that municipalities seeking grants must have in place a local pay-to-play ordinance. So this is good news, I assume. And the second thing is uh, the New Jersey Election Law Enforcement Commission prohibits campaign contributions from criminals. So even these two people who were acquitted because they did not gain office were still guilty of taking campaign contributions from a criminal, even though they didn't know he was a criminal. I don't, I don't know that we can, we, well, uh, I don't know that we, we're going to say whether they're guilty or not. The interesting thing we found with campaign finance and pay to play is it's just complicated things so much you don't know where the money's coming from anymore. That, that in terms of, of, of money, money is being wheeled from one county organization to another where the only people that know who delivered the checks are the people who got them. Ted and I, during the governor's race, had a, a moment of glory that we really enjoyed and it was, you know, it was a real accomplishment for us, but five years ago it would have been no big deal. The accomplishment was we got a hold of a database of campaign donations to Virginia. Through that, we were able to back our way in to figure out who's funding the campaigns in New Jersey. Because Virginia had a much better you know, disclosure statute, and we were able to find people. Their disclosure statute, if I don't, if I don't get this wrong, was if you give to anyone in Virginia then you have to not only disclose all of your Virginia donations, but all of your donations. As a result, we were able to find out which casinos were funding John Corzine and which insurance companies were funding Chris Christie. It's made it really, really complicated. As for the ELEC point, an ELEC violation is a civil, it's a civil violation. So it could be against the rules, but unless it had an elect, for an elect violation to become a, a criminal matter where there's guilt or innocence at stake, it's got to be a, a much bigger deal. So, yeah, I'm sure these guys don't care about paying back the money now that they were able to be acquitted in federal criminal court. In a, dem, in a democratic state where Corzine had tons of money, a lot more than the Republican candidate, what was it that made him think he wasn't going to win? You know, that's actually the first time anybody's asked me that question. Well, there's, there's what, that was the first time that question has been asked. The, well, the question is, in a democratic state, what was it that made Corzine believe he was going to lose? The first thing is, Corzine, for anybody who's met him, I don't know if there's any people in the room who've met him, I don't know if he's been a guest here, but Corzine himself is a really, really nice guy. And Christie also, but I'm not, we're talking about Corzine. Corzine, however, has the distinction of being a really, really bad politician. Like bad, really bad, like off the charts bad. It's been suggested by people close to him that he may well have been the worst governor in New Jersey history. I don't know, we had one guy who was a cross-dresser and a crook, and we had another guy who, who revealed in his will that he had been taking money while he was governor. So let's, I think Corzine's probably not the worst ever on the spectrum. Corzine, Corzine had an inability to connect with people. And as a result, he, he, and he was running against a guy who has a great ability to connect with people. So remember, elections are comparative ventures. You know, it's never somebody running against themselves except in the Soviet Union. So, you know, Christie was a really, really good candidate by comparison. Corzine was a really, really bad candidate. Now, you also look back at what Corzine had going for him when he won the first time. And that was people perceived that his commitment to fix the state's 
perpetual budget problems, that that commitment was not only real, that he would succeed, because he was a genius from Wall Street. Which is true, he was a genius from Wall Street, but he did not fix the budget crisis. And in fact, having covered Trenton during that period, Corzine ran away from a number of key fixes because of politics of his own Democratic Party. So the polls had turned against him. He was uncomfortable running. He was uncomfortable spending the amounts of money he thought he would have to, he, he was able to spend the first time around. And then on top of it, you had him really scared of Chris Christie. We didn't know until we reported the Jersey Sting how completely scared to death of Chris Christie he was. Really, I, I would never have thought it. Honestly, I never would have thought it. I was always trained to believe that all things being equal, when you got 300 million, you win. In a democratic state. But the thing is, see, that's why, that's something else. If you go back into the annals of Star Ledger modern history in 2009, you see these flare ups of democratic leaders, the ones who really run the democratic state, running away from Corzine. And you see some of it now with some of the political bosses actually getting in close with Chris Christie. There was a lot of treachery in the Democratic Party. Corzine could not depend on the entrenched Democratic structure. He could depend on Democratic voters if he could get them out to the polls. But we live in a, a, a traditional Northeastern organization state. Unions matter, political organizations matter, and the political organizational leaders ran away from John Corzine. In some ways, they actually were had backroom deals cut with Chris Christie, where they were supporting him or agreeing to not work hard for John Corzine. I'll give you a great little anecdote, which is actually one of my favorite anecdotes, and I love saying it because the mayor of Woodbridge, the new mayor, every time I say it, he wants to throttle me for saying it. So on election day 2009, um, election report, campaign reporters, we're, we're largely done with our work until the nighttime. You know, the kids, the interns, they go out to the polls and interview people. Why did you vote? I'm not being critical. I was a kid, too. But the reporters who've covered the campaign sleep late after having not slept at all. We then get up late. We then go to work late. We work late, late, late until the evening is done, and we get the results. So I met a colleague of mine that afternoon for a late lunch at Jose Tejas on Route 1 in Woodbridge. Damn it, if I don't walk in and sit right next to the mayor of Woodbridge, a Democrat, with all of his senior gang and a couple of Democratic freeholders, all these guys that run the Democratic voter turnout operations in Middlesex County. Oh, and all of which are supposed to be out there exactly. shaking the trees. Three o'clock on election day. They're not supposed to be down in Coronas and eating tortilla chips at Jose Tejas. But being that I actually know what the signs are, we all schmooze, we shook hands, how you doing, great election day. And then five hours later, because that's Ted's job. He's crunching the numbers as they come into the main office. And he sees that Woodbridge basically didn't show, up. didn't show up. Woodbridge is a critical town. If you are going to win, if you ever run for, for mayor, ma'am, or governor, I should say, if you ever decide to run, let me give you a little piece of amateur advice. You, if you're a Democrat, Woodbridge has to not only show up in big numbers, you have to win by big numbers. It's a huge Democratic town. And if you either don't get a big turnout, or if, God forbid, as a Democrat, it goes Republican, that means you've lost. And that's exactly what happened. As we found out 24 hours later, Senator, State Senator Bill Baroni, who's now the head of the Port Authority, walked into Chris Christie's suite at the Parsippany Hilton, and, or the Marriott, whatever it is now, and said to him, you've won. You're the governor. And Christie, of course, said, what the hell are you talking about? It's like 6 o'clock at night or, or 7 o'clock at night. And he knew what he was talking about because Woodbridge having been here when Jim McGreevy ran in terms of turnout, no one showed up. They had fallen off the cliff because Mayor McCormick and his gang had secretly decided that Chris Christie was a better guy for Woodbridge. You're welcome. Thank you very, very much for having us. Thank you.